However, now, moving onwards, and all the way from London, um, we have our next speaker, who is engaged in recruiting almost 400 firefighters while focusing on diversity and inclusion. She has the responsibility for driving the development, implementation, and effective management of the London Fire Brigade's leadership strategy. She trained to become a full-time firefighter at the age of 31. Leaving her job within design and now an op operational officer as well as working for a more diverse workforce within, within the London Fire Brigade. Welcome, Keely Foster. <laughs> question. Uh, it's one that I've been asked many, many times. Um, I think it's safe to say that actually uh, becoming a firefighter wasn't something that I ever thought about um, when I was leaving school. Obviously, you know, it's quite visible to see women as police officers and in other roles as paramedics. Um, but I didn't really know what the fire service did. You know, when we saw them putting out fires locally, that was it. What else do you do? So it never really sort of, you know, struck a chord that actually that was a job that I really wanted to do. But later in life, I soon realised that actually some of the life skills that I've built up, that actually I, I really thought that they were transferable into the fire service. Therefore, it was a role that suddenly um, being introduced to by a male colleague of mine, I think this is the one for me. Fantastic. We look forward to hearing all that you have to say. Firstly, I'd uh, just like to say um, a big thank you uh, to everybody for inviting me here today. And I've truly been inspired by some of the um, presentations and some of the conversations that I've heard uh, yesterday so far. So first of all, I'd just like to just run through some of the things I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about a brief history of women in the fire service and also firefighting. The challenges that we've faced, some of the legislation and governance that we have to comply by, and the call to action. What are we doing now? Let's put some of the positives on it now. Let's draw a line in the sand and let's say, what are we going to do to increase the representation of women in the fire service? So just to give you a brief history, um, firefighting uh, was originally provided in the UK by private insurance companies. So therefore, it was only really for the wealthy. They would have a fire mark on a building and only those appliances that were linked to those insurance companies would attend and put the fire out. If you didn't have that facility, the fire was never put out for you. And the Parish Pump Act in just 1708 suddenly then um, decided that people who couldn't afford this service could pay, go to their local parish and pay an amount, a small sum of money to, have, uh, to be provided with a fire appliance, fire engine uh, that could attend fires and keep them safe. In that process, many women and children were involved in deploying, pumping, and refilling those appliances, and ultimately extinguishing fires. So from a very, very early time, women have been involved. Under Queen Victoria, uh, insurance companies gave way to a public service, and the London Fire Brigade was born, with our first Chief Officer, Sir Eyre Massey Shaw. Um, so Mayor Assey Shaw could be seen as a little bit of a pioneer, in a way, in the fact that he visited places like Girton College. And I love this photograph. Um, I'm not sure about the personal protective equipment that they're wearing, um, but they've certainly got their heads protected, so uh, if anything falls on them. Um, so he visited Girton College, which was all female, and he taught them firefighting skills so they could look after their establishment and they could ultimately extinguish fires on their premises. And I think that is an absolutely fantastic photo of one of many that you can find in our um, Fire Brigade Museum. So, closely after that, many other places followed suit. All female, schools, colleges, and even some department stores had all female firefighting um, sections. And this paved the way for basically the two world wars. So where women took over traditionally male roles. 
So in the run-up to World War II, the LFB became part of a national fire service. And to support this, a voluntary service was set up called the Auxiliary Fire Service in 1938. And these are some of the women of the Outriders that were part of that auxiliary service. And a huge recruitment campaign began uh, to try and supplement the current officers that were within the London Fire Brigade. And of course, obviously, the majority of those officers had signed up to military conscription and had then gone overseas. So ultimately, the firefighting service pretty much uh, relied on the auxiliary fire service to extinguish fires. And they decided that at that time, it was very, very important that women were allowed to join. They were issued with basic uniforms. Obviously, these ones look quite smart, but there's a bit of a recurring uh, theme here where there were ill-fitting uniforms and some women had to make do with some post office uniforms, uh, a steel helmet and some rubber boots. Um, but after that, women obviously went into many roles within the Auxiliary Fire Service, including control and communications, and also obviously maintaining the appliances and uh, driving roles. There were huge acts of bravery during this time, and there was a lady called Gillian Tanner. And I just look at the, uh, the bottom left-hand picture, and that sort of just shows some of the, uh, some of the dangers that she faced. So Gillian Tanner was a lorry driver, and she used to drive these trucks through London, and obviously there was a complete blackout, there were no street lights, there were no headlights, she had no power steering, she had nothing else to guide her, there was huge potholes and huge craters in the road, and she, whilst doing that, there were incendiary devices raining down her, on her at all times. And also, just to mention, she was driving a petrol lorry. So it just shows you some of the dangers that she faced. And she subsequently later on received a medal for bravery. Basically, the AFS proved so useful, it continued until 1968, with women becoming officers and taking non-operational roles. So you can see we'd already fallen back into our gender stereotypes, that actually when the business need was there, women were in the forefront, but actually subsequently afterwards, we automatically fell back into providing support services. So this is us. What I'd like to say is the London Fire Brigade family. And I do believe we are a family, and I do believe with our current commissioner, we are moving into a more people-focused attitude. We're governed now by the London Fire Commissioner, we have approximately 5,650 5, staff. Just under 5,000 of those are operational with a hunt across 102 stations. We serve one of the most ethnically diverse cities in the world with a population growing rapidly, currently of about 8.5 million. And that covers over 611 square miles. And believe it or not, even uh, in some parts of London and across London as a whole, there are over 300 languages spoken. So you can see the need for us to diversify as a service. Our journey, though, decided um, for in diversity started in the 1980s. We came from a predominantly naval background. So pretty much people recruiting, coming into the service, were all ex-naval. So you can imagine the culture then was exclusively white male. The then leader of the Greater London Council pushed for change and demanded that the London Fire Brigade, as you can see here, became more reflective of the city that it served. So the LFB first established a recruitment team for the first time. We changed our selection process to be fit for purpose for a modern day fire service, removing the requirement of height, chest expansion, and other things that were irrelevant for the role and some of the modern day equipment. We also started uh, equality training for all staff, and most importantly, targeting, uh, targeted advertising for underrepresented groups, so women and black, Asian, minority, ethnic. So in 1982, 
The first woman, op fully operational woman, joined the service, and this is Sue Batten. So she joined the service at a time, well, I have to um, say that actually uh, she's a real inspiration, as was the other women that joined with her at the time. I can't imagine what it was like, and she's big beaming smile there, which is good to see, but I can't imagine what it was like during those times to try and break into that culture. And for me, um, these people are huge role models. So 60 other women followed her shortly afterwards. And throughout the 80s and 90s, women continued to join the service in operations and as control officers. But as I say, this was a very, very different world. It was a world full of harassment and bullying. And some of the things we've heard here previously, poor uniform, <coughs> poor facilities, poor policies that didn't reflect and didn't encourage women not only to join the organisation, but also to remain. And we lost many, many women. Some, thankfully, completed 30 years service, but we did lose a lot of women. And like I say, some of the things that some of these women threw, went through are quite unimaginable. So you have to ask yourself that the demand was there, the push went in politically, but were we organisationally ready to receive those people? Well, no, we weren't. And that's one of the questions that we need to ask ourselves with these initiatives and anything we do in the future. Are we organisationally ready to receive these people and retain them? So, moving on. And this gives you a, an idea of just how far or not we've come. So, if you consider how, actually and looking at the last, uh, how many obviously operational officers we have in the service, and obviously, yes, as you can see, there have been cuts on the service as the years have gone on, but obviously this moves from the end of the 80s, end of the 90s, and obviously where we are today in 2018. So obviously starting off with uh, 20 women, 80 BME, moving to 160 women by the end of the 1990s, and 360 BME, and how we are now with 337 women and 621 BME members of staff. Now disappointingly, I came in in 2002, where there was approximately 300 women. We only have an extra 37 since then. Now that's due to poor recruitment, not targeting in the right areas, but also the retention of women as well. Once we've got them, we must make sure everything's in place that people want to stay in the organisation. And then our trainee firefighter intake for women has remained fairly static over the years. And I've put this one in to show the ambitious target, and you could call it ambitious, this is our medium term target of trying to reach 18%. Um, but as you can see, it's remained static throughout the years, so we've never really increased it. We've kind of become, or were, lazy recruiters. We didn't have um, any sort of, when we put out our, our adverts, we, the demand was always there. We didn't have to go looking for people that wanted to become a firefighter. What we didn't have was the diversity, and we still need to work on that. So obviously we're waiting for the 18, 19 figures. Um, as Manisa said, we basically, we, I'm recruiting 400 firefighters at the moment by end of June 2019. And in that, we put out our campaign recently and we received six, six and a half thousand applications. But again, only 13% women. So what are some of the drivers? Some of the things that we have to comply by. So obviously now we're governed by the Home Office. And the Home Office have recently done a huge reform in the fire and rescue services and brought in the inspectorate. And the fire minister, a couple of years ago, addressed the key people and chiefs within the fire and rescue service and set out what needed to be done, and it was very, very clear. And he said, a culture shift is needed. Action is needed on career progression, inclusive working practices, and recruitment. 
The new inspectorate will identify barriers to diversity and each service will respond to the issues it faces. It was very, very clear. There was no mistaking. You, may, you must act or we will force you to act to change the service. With that as well, we are heavily influenced and obviously governed within London by the Mayor of London, who this year, to mark the 100, 100 years centenary of the women's votes, launched a campaign, uh, hashtag behind every great city. And this was to celebrate the 100 years and the right to vote, but also champion the achievements of women and tackle gender inequality in roles. So one of the big things that we have to report on is some of our pay gap reporting, um, gender pay gap reporting, and it's not just giving the figures across all the functional bodies and across all the organisations. We have to have a clear action plan as how we're going to achieve it and how we're going to move women into upper roles within the organisation. The LGA, the Local Government Association for Fire and Rescue, brought in a memorandum of understanding between key stakeholders um, across all the fire and rescue services, including unions and including chief officers. It covered equality and diversity, behaviours and organisational culture. And basically tackling the fact that nationally we only have 5% women and 3.9% BME across the board. So just one of their ambitious targets, you judge whether we'll get there by 2025, they expect 30% of women, 30% women in the organisations in the fire rescue service nationally. So obviously we needed to act, and obviously with the National Fire Chiefs Council as a collective group, we started to put plans in place, most notably for them, the People Plan. And internally, we wrote a new 10-year inclusion strategy. Now this strategy is very ambitious, it began in 2016 and it sets out what we will do to promote an inclusive culture at stations, in offices and in the community. It also states that we must recruit, retain, develop and promote a diverse workforce. And this document is a public document, it is on our London Fire Brigade website and you're able to download it there if anybody, if you're interested in, in reading it further. But it sets out everything that we need to do in order to not only meet some of the Home Office requirements, but on a moral level, what we must do to become a better service for the public. So as part of that, the first task was, what we decided to do was look at women. So it was very clear the Commissioner wanted to up and set the target of 18% and we needed to understand why we were not recruiting the amount of women that we required. What was it that people just like myself earlier on just didn't think of joining the Fire and Rescue Service? So we brought in Future Thinking, an external company, um, to look at this um, and to look at why we only have 7% uh, of women in the London Fire Brigade. So, as I said, the uh, recruitment figures for women remained static at 10%, um, but what they found was there was an overall lack of awareness for the firefighting role and what being a firefighter entailed. And some of the other things that they said um, were women were put off by the application process, they said our website wasn't particularly appealing and didn't draw people in, and there was a real lack of selling the job. So regardless of the fact that actually we're very, very proud of our brand of the London Fire Brigade and some of the way we look at externally, the LFB logo and everything, actually marketing-wise, for the purposes of recruitment, we do not sell ourselves very well within these targeted groups. So one of the things in there, one of the things it does question right at the very end, and again, this is a document that can be downloaded on our website, was obviously the increase from 7% up to 18%. And it really questions, was that an extra 11% realistic? Are we actually going to achieve that? Would we ever achieve 18% and subsequently 30% as called for nationally? So the main findings and actions uh, were, obviously women were self-confident, 
It was said that women felt like uh, men would apply for a role if they met only 60% of the criteria, but women in general wanted to meet, would always want to meet 100% before they uh, joined a role or before they even considered it. They didn't see other women within the service. They didn't see role models, so they never thought it was a job for them. They wanted family friendly and flexibility within the role, clear pathways of progression and support in order to get there, benefits and remuneration, also growth and stimulation. So they wanted, they wanted to feel that it was a job that was fulfilling for them. Variety. They didn't believe that it had variety in there, they thought it was quite monotonous and they didn't re really feel that there was a variety within the role. And lastly, the findings um, picked out that actually we needed to target in certain areas and there was a perception that it would be, take a certain type of woman to be, become a firefighter. Now, I'll leave that out there as to whether or not you think that actually that is the case. What is that certain type of woman? So these were some of the findings from it, and they said, this is some of the actions that they basically said that we needed to achieve. So it was around offering open days for underrepresented groups and targeting, which I'll talk about in a moment with our outreach team, attract the right type of woman, but again, it was finding that right type of woman, um, targeted recruitment efforts, changing our website, questioning the 18% target, demystifying the role and the media, tackling the media, which I'll talk about in a moment as well. So these are the three elements that I really do believe uh, provide that collaborative approach to help with a recruitment campaign. Now all of these exist or have existed for a while within the London Fire Brigade, but they never really merged together. They worked in isolation in some cases. So now we work together quite closely. We have our communications department, which do all the outward facing as well as some of our internal comms. They've been hugely successful in some of our fire safety campaigns but they set out to engage the media company to look at some of the advertising and some of the uh, videos and some of the campaign material that we could do to target women. The outreach team. The outreach team have proved invaluable. I came in through the outreach route, which were a team that went out into the community, provided open days for people from underrepresented groups to get an idea of what the role of a firefighter entails. They could turn up to this day, they could practice the tests, they could speak to actual firefighters, to role models, and they could do some of the, most importantly, for women, they could actually practice some of the physical tests and actually start that training process. They also go out to actually try and encourage young, more young people to, enjoy, um, to consider the um, role of a firefighter. And my area, talent and recruitment. So obviously, we feed back a continuous cycle into each of these three areas. So it's my duty then to look at the recruitment process, make sure it's fit for purpose, and make sure if I identify any areas where I feel people are struggling, women, BME, need additional support, guidance, I feed that back into communications and outreach. So we've got that continuous cycle of keeping people warm and keeping people engaged. So communications, first of all. So on the basis of the research from Future Thinking, the communications department set about producing a video to try and encourage more women into the service. And I think, hopefully, we should be able to play it.
see a completely different approach. Right or wrong? Does that actually relay what a firefighter does? Is that the modern day firefighter? This is some of the work that obviously some of the, public, the general public don't necessarily see and don't necessarily, necessarily understand. So our utilisation rate is only 7%. 3% of that is going out to fires. So the rest of the time, we are going out into the community, training, so on and so forth. So it's very, very important that anybody coming in understands the full role of a firefighter. So from this, working with a media company, um, and this is the part that I don't understand, not being that technically minded, um, they managed to work out the data. So they could work out who had clicked on it, the demographic of that person, how long they watched it for, and subsequently um, you know, work out and try and get some data, draw down some data from it. We received slight increase in applications, but only up to 13%. So not nearly enough. So even this just shows that we still have, this is the start of the journey, and we still have a long, long way to go. And interesting as well, I say approach right or wrong. When the future thinking went, when future thinking went out and started to talk to people, interestingly, within some of that group, once we explained that this was some of the work that firefighter did as well, interest went down with women. So some of them wanted just that pure firefighting and action as well. So we have to bear that in mind. We went completely this way, but actually it may take that balanced approach as well. Again, it could be, what is that right type of woman? So the three elements. First of all, outreach. Hugely important, as I say. Uh, it was reintroduced in 2016. As I, as I said, I came in through that route. Completely invaluable. Um, to turn up on those open days and be so welcomed, be able to chat to like-minded firefighters, be able to ask some of the questions, the burning questions that actually were in my mind that I needed to know about the role. And as I said, most importantly for women to practice those physical tests was really, really important. So the outreach team aims to increase applications from women and BAME communities and also LGBT and encourage young people to consider their career in the fire service. They conduct open days, but they also, more importantly as well, go out to events, visit schools, and just try to increase the general aware awareness of the firefighter role. And this uh, appliance has served uh, sort of a multiple of uh, different uses now. It was originally our pride appliance for our 150-year uh, anniversary and was wrapped accordingly um, for that. Um, but now we subsequently use it for all community safety and outreach events and it's when it moves around London it really is quite striking. So they will also look at myth busting as well and just making sure that re people really understand uh, the role of a firefighter. Of some of the assessment process that we have. As I've said, uh, we need to recruit 400 firefighters by June um, 2019 to maintain our establishment. So that may seem like a mammoth task, but when you've got six and a half thousand applicants, actually, you know, how do we how do we move them through a process? How do we make sure that we're not losing great people going forward? And that's some of the big issues that I face. So obviously they go through the application stage, and from there we, we go into our first sift, which is uh, we do a situational judgment test and behavioural styles questionnaire. So that really asks box standard questions um, where people have you know, a multiple choice of answer and that gets translated as to whether or not that person is fit for that role. It's a great sift for cutting down those numbers, but as I said before, we need to be really, really careful, and this is why I'm gonna be reviewing some of these, these areas going forward. We could be losing good people. Some of those answers are very ambiguous and actually, you know, when we look at people, they may have some real great qualities and skills going forward to become a firefighter. We need to make sure we capture that and we make sure that actually they could be the right person that could develop into that role. 
The third one down is very important for us. This is the first time we see people face to face. This is the first time they walk into the London Fire Brigade environment. And for me, that assessment centre is where we capture them. It should be welcoming. They walk into that assessment centre and they'll do a structured interview for about an hour. And they'll start to do uh, other tests like role plays where they work in groups of other people that are applicants as well and we start to observe some of the behaviours going forward. How do they interact? What are their communication skills? And then from there we move on to the work related tests. Um, now these are obviously a series of tests, testing manual de dexterity, claustrophobia, coordination, the ability to follow instruction and of course physical fitness. So this is where, for female perspective, we have often lose a lot of candidates. Uh, more recently, um, we have been a little bit more successful, just because we have employed the principle of explain and train. So on our website, we started to upload videos of some of the fitness tests, and actually translating them. For me, it seems quite simple, ladder lift. Someone said that to me, I'd know exactly what I was doing. But for somebody coming in, they don't know. Is it waist height? Is it above your head? They had absolutely no clue whatsoever. So we had to explain the test and explain the equivalent of what they could do within the gym. So if you have access to a gym, this is some of the equipment you might want to use and train on. So once we'd started that explanation, once we'd started to work with outreach, once we started that engagement and keeping warm, um, because again, often there could be a matter of only two weeks before um, you've received your notification, you're going to the next stage. If somebody works on the assessment centre, becomes successful, gets two week notification, they're going to work related, for many women that's too late. They needed to start training way back, even before the application, when the seed was sown, that they wanted to become a firefighter. So it's very important we get that information out again is providing, is front-loading as much information as possible onto our website. So that's the, the physical test aspect of it. So, moving on, uh, this is Megan. Megan's attached to my team at the moment, uh, looking at uh, some of my inclusion team and assisting them at the moment. So obviously Megan is a fire cadet, desperately wants to join the fire service, and uh, we're looking at routes uh, for fire cadets and a natural progression into the London Fire Brigade. So it's about doing things differently. So obviously we've had our traditional entry route as before. Um, we've got those six and a half thousand applicants, but actually we're not getting the diversity that we need. Currently there's 62% females within the fire cadets nationally. They look completely different to us as a service. The diversity in those roles is incredible. They follow the same rank structure, so as they become a fire cadet and work their way up, they do exactly the same as us, to eventually becoming cadet ambassadors, where they actually sit on some key meetings. We actually utilise them very, very well. They're very well respected. They come to some of our events. They're involved in some of our um, key initiatives um, going forward, and they are a complete asset to us. Once they're in that cadet service, once they've finished and they get to a particular age, they can become cadet instructors, but after that, it's finished. So we've trained up, we've engaged with, we've made that link with a group of young people, diverse young people, and we're not tapping in to providing a progression route into the service. Why not? So this is something that I'm working on right now to make sure that actually we work with our youth and we make sure that actually we start to sow that seed early, start to bring them into cadets and bring them into the London Fire Brigade. So as a part of our, and this is why youth work is so important for us, so obviously we run a life program as well, local intervention fire education as well. This is only a week long course, but again, not only does it sort of um, think about youth coming into the organisation, but it also breaks down barriers. So we've been hugely successful in tackling antisocial behaviour going forward and actually forging that link between a uniform service and youth out there so they can see that we, what we actually do. Also, we're bringing in apprenticeships. 
So when I go back to England in a week's time, I will be welcoming in the first apprenticeship group. So all firefighters going forward will be apprentices. So big decision for us. Um, some of the key communicators for us were how do we get that across to staff on stations? Will it be additional work for them? What do we tell the individuals coming into the role? So this was a government initi initiative that all organisations over a certain, um, a certain amount of employees had to pay into the levy. So and with that, we draw down apprenticeship money. So we have to participate in it. So with that, we could have people coming into the organisation that are 41 years old. How do we tell them that they're apprentices? That they are an apprentice. That seems like a very young thing, or was traditionally a young um, scheme in the past. So that's some of the work we're, we're um, moving forward at the moment and drawing people in. But what it does do is upskill people, give them professional qualifications, and this is one of the things going forward. And we're waiting for this piece of research coming out of the um, Black, Asian, and Minority Ethnic uh, Community. Obviously, you know, it's a lot, a lot more difficult to do that research because it's over a wide group of people. But one of the things we found we're trying to engage with that group is in a lot of areas they see the fire service as a very low social um, employee group, basically. Um, they see it, they almost in some cases align it to refuse workers and people like that. They, they want their people to be doctors, dentists, scientists, and actually they see the role of the fire service as being very manual and very low skilled. We need to change that, we need to professionalise the service, we need to sell ourselves more within that community, and that's some of the work we're doing also as well. Another part of it is our talent management. So just to uh, let you know, my, one of my part, and obviously I'm getting the uh, <laughs> must wrap up, um, so the other parts of my work is talent management doing things differently, setting up a talent management framework. So actually what we do is we bring people into the organisation, we have an end-to-end -end strategy, and it's very, very important, I've spoken about the fire brigade family, but it's very important that actually within that we make sure that we have a correct induction process, so as soon as they walk through that door, they are, we are, they are engaged with us. From the moment they walk through the door, we cannot lose those people. From there, they would move into the talent management process, underpinned by a robust appraisal um, programme and we will start to move them through the organisation so that we success for succession planning and making sure we fill key roles and also basically identify high potential going forward, the people that want to develop and the people that display a high potential. So for us it's all around doing things differently, so putting put aside the traditional route looking at things differently and looking at rolling recruitment going forward. Once we've met the establishment next year, I'll be looking at much smaller rolling recruitment and targeted in specific areas. That way we can make sure um, some of our processes and some of our testing is fit for purpose and we're not losing good people along the way. Very lastly, I want to finish on this one because this was very, very important for us and uh, it was created a storm in effect. But one of our key things um, was our communica communications department was asked to proactively engage with advertising agencies, journalists, publishers and broadcasters to try and tackle the outdated term of firemen. We haven't been called firemen since the 80s. We are known as firefighters. And all too often, and this is where it starts with young children and gender stereotyping, all too often the term fireman is used within movies, within advertising, in newspapers, and our communications department set out very proactively to challenge that term. And we also used some of our internal people to do it, myself included. Um, it, it, it basically caused a social media frenzy. So it just showed you, actually, it was very emotive, um, disappointingly, some women came back at us uh, as well with a negative approach, but it actually really did show the need that actually we need to tax tackle some of this sexist terminology going forward in order to recruit a diverse workforce. Thank you.